Austria, Mexico, and Italy. Tchaikovsky is the author of biographies of Lawrence Ferlinghetti and Charles Bukowski uh, for the Poetry Foundation, as well as the critical memoir, Whitman's Wild Children, Portraits of Twelve Poets. His papers are held at the Bancroft Library, University of California, Berkeley, and Tchaikovsky received the 2017 Jack Miller Poetry Prize awarded at Colorado Jack Miller Festival. Gerd Stern is best known as a poet and media artist. He has several published books of poems, and his oral history from beat scene, poet, to psychedelic multimedia artist, 1948 to 1978, has been published by the Regional Oral History Office of the Bancroft Library, University of California. Californians know and remember Stern as a member of the beat poetry and art scene in the Bay Area in the 1950s. <clears throat> and for a time, Stern lived on a Waldo Point barge near the SS Vallejo and took an active role in the Sausalito artist community. In the 1960s, Stern co-founded the Arts Technology Cooperative, USCO, in New York, whose work was featured in the Walker Art Center's recent exhibition, Hippie Modernism, The Struggle for Utopia, which toured museums throughout <coughs> the country in 2016, including the Berkeley Art Museum. Stern was also a co-founder and president of the public company Intermedia Systems Corporation, the interdisciplinary company affiliated with the Harvard Business School that existed in the space between psychology, business, and art. In the 70s, Intermedia Systems conducted behavioral science experiments, pioneered audio-visual hardware, and produced multimedia art around the world. This is just the tip of Stern's iceberg, so let's get to the conversation. Please welcome Neely Tchaikovsky and Gerd Stern. Everybody here good? Yeah. So, um, Gerd Stern is, uh, it, it, well, the first thing I can say about him is it, it's pretty easy. He's just so fascinating because I've been obsessed with the idea of, of uh, that old idea of the Renaissance person, the Renaissance man, somebody who's in, like, like Michelangelo, he's one of my favorite poets ever. I even found his Italian more accessible than modern Italian, and yet he's a sculptor and painter, and, and this guy is all over the map. You know, the, the, the stern terrain is everywhere. Uh, it turns out we have several friends in common. I mean, you know, James Broughton was a close friend. I did a book on Ferlinghetti, and uh, I really like the idea that, that I'm 73 and I'm talking to somebody who's 17 years older than me. <laughs> and, and, but, but about five months ago, I had dinner with Ferlinghetti, who's 98. I've known him 50 years, and I said, my God, I'm with somebody who commanded a landing craft at Normandy in 45. And, and it was like a new person to me. And now he's 99, he's gonna make it to 100, Gerd, and I know you knew him. It's great to see one of Lawrence's paintings here. But, but Gerd, I want to ask you, I, I know your family left Germany. They were in the cheese business, and, and you, you, they, you were born in 28, and I think you came in 36, and I wondered about your impressions of America, and, and uh, even projecting ahead, what led you to the life you led? Hey, I don't have a clue. <laughs> <laughs> Cemeteries 
in Germany. <laughs> so it's a border land. And borders are an interesting uh, experience for a poet. You know, <coughs> all kinds of borders. Uh, so that's that. But, you know, really, I don't. This is our first meeting. I've heard about him, and apparently he's heard about me. And yes, there are all those people that we both knew. I mean, when I knew Larry Furling, he wasn't named Furling yet, he was named Larry Furling. That's right. And uh, you know, it was only later on, after City Lights was bought, uh, that he took his great grandfather's Italian name, because um, he was no longer in partnership with Peter Martin, uh, Emma Goldman's son, strangely enough. Uh, so there's all of that. I don't know. I guess we're going to read something eventually. Uh, in the meantime, we can talk about anything, right? <laughs> we're not here to Another talk socks. about something. We're here to talk about anything. <laughs> well, you're, you're probably one of the only, since I'm the biographer for Lingetti, I know a lot of the nooks and crannies of his life. But to hear somebody mention uh, his partner, I mean, he did go into business in City Lives with Peter Martin, who later opened, I bet you knew the store in New York that he opened, and, and Lawrence got the name City Lights. Of course, there's a reference to Chaplin, but there was also City Lights Magazine. George Late, I believe, uh, did you know him? I knew George very well. <laughs> there you and go. Not only did I know him, I knew his three wives so he, at the same time. I <laughs> 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 bet you did. <laughs> and not only that, yeah, he was the, the first person to turn me on to peyote with uh, American Indians, the president. And uh, uh, I, I haven't heard the name George Lake for, uh, <laughs> forever. You know? That's wild that you mentioned it. Well, it's, a, it, it's really important in San Francisco because he gave the name to the store. Really? And, oh, absolutely. Lawrence, Lawrence loved that magazine, City Lights. And of course, he, I mean, I used to go with Lawrence to watch uh, Chaplin movies. And he'd be sitting there laughing, and, and he had this kind of homespun chuckle, and I think, my God, this is one of the guys of the beat generation that I was reading in the 50s. It's like this corn pone laugh. It was really amazing. <laughs> but, you know, speaking of late, there's another person I know you knew well, and he was like a great eminence over, I bet you know who I'm thinking, over San Francisco in the 40s and 50s in terms of writing, the writing community, uh, and, and kind of what would later be the beats. And, you know what I mean? Lived up on... Uh, Petrero Hill? Kenneth Rexford. There you go. Rexford. How, about, how about Kenneth? A lot of you know, he's a very great, very great poet. Kenneth was the royalty of poetry, and he had a salon. I mean, I don't think we used that word at the time, but he, he was there every weekend and we were there, and anybody who came to the, the Bay Area who was at all involved in either the avant-garde or poetry came to his living room. And there was room for quite a lot of people, despite the fact that he was married and had children uh, several times. And uh, he was, uh, you know, he was from Chicago, which, uh, is a whole different trip, and uh, you know, and the city of lots of heavy-duty writers, uh, and uh, he took that very seriously. And the other thing he took very seriously was what we are now calling politics. Uh, and, uh, he was uh, totally involved in social concerns. And, uh, and he, he spoke volubly and excitedly and dramatically, and we loved it. And he was uh, the center of a great uh, amount of disputation because he was the only person that I ever took 
a poetry workshop from. <laughs> and it's a funny story because uh, I read a poem there, which I still have as in one of my early books, and it mentions the word bird, and it says to me, Garrett, you cannot just say bird. You've got to be specific. We have to know what kind of a bird it is. I said, it's a very specific bird. His name was Charlie Parker. I went on to something else. Like, not that he didn't know who Charlie Parker was, but that his name was Bird. That's, 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 that's interesting. Well, well Rex Roth, of course, also, uh, he was very influential on, on the poetry of Robert Duncan. Jack Spicer Frilinghetti, Lawrence would go religiously to his salon and uh, learn a lot from him. And, and uh, Lawrence says that Rex Roth definitely uh, helped him in developing his own social consciousness. Uh -huh. You know, and the fact that, I mean, Frilinghetti was at Nagasaki 45 days after the bomb dropped, and that made him a pacifist. But meeting Rex Roth kind of honed it and he really got the idea of a West Coast kind of anarchist, independent tradition, which, which I think uh, some of these artists uh, subscribe to. And uh, they felt there was a difference between the East Coast and the West Coast, and, and more of an anarchist thing than a, than a proto-communist kind of thing. I'm sounding too professorial, so go ahead. Not at all. <laughs> all right. All right. I'm, I'm fascinated. But you know, the, 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 the topic of this exhibition has to do with uh, the Sausalito waterfront yeah. and uh, my barge on which I lived for a long time and which is a really stupid story how I got it. Uh, uh, I spent a very few days at, at the scholarship at Black Mountain College and uh, a woman who owned a bar in uh, Sausalito named the Tin Angel, Peggy Toke Watkins, mm -hmm. uh, was responsible for my owning the barge, which mm -hmm. uh, was on the land of Gordon Onslow Ford, who uh, wanted to invite me to lunch because he appreciated the fact that he had introduced me to the composer, Harry Parch, and that I had been working with him and Gordon was so appreciative of that that he wanted to give me a gift. And now I, I was very uh, well moneyed in those days, so I thought maybe it was going to be money. But he didn't have that much money, but his wife was a San Francisco heiress and she had plenty. So uh, that's not what he wanted to give me. He offered me a berth for a boat on land that he owned in Sausalito. And I thought to myself, did you ever get a stupider gift? <laughs> you know, what are you going to do with a place to put a boat when you don't have a boat? You know? And you don't even want a boat. But a little while later, I'm sitting in the Tin Angel, and Peggy is talking to her lesbian with sculptor named Blanche Sherwood, and she says, if you don't get rid of that goddamn barge, I'm going to stop living with you. So I, I said, oh, well, what's this barge? <laughs> and, and I love says, it. It's floating in Don Arquez's shipyard, and she has no business owning it. It's huge. And I said, what are you going to do with it? She's got to get rid of it. I said, you, would you like to give it away? <laughs> barge. They look at each other and they say, sure, we'll give it away. I said, I better go look at it first. You know? And I did. I looked at it and Don Arquez told me, yeah, it's going to take a lot of work to get it going because it's got mm -hmm. leaks all over. Well, it took us two months of like maybe 20 or 25 people from the No Name Bar, which was a literary bar in uh, Sausalito. And uh, we got it floating, and we took it over to, to Gordon Russell for his land, 
with the tugboat from our cast ship shift. <laughs> but it was a hell of a lot of work <laughs> and, and dirty work. And you can't, you could barely stand up under the deck. So, well, anyway, so that's how I got to live on a bar <laughs> next to the ferry boat Vallejo, which this oh. exhibition is about. <laughs> so, so I, I'm interested in how uh, uh, Wolfgang Palin uh, segued into this uh, group, or did he much? I mean, there's the wonderful painting here. I know his name, but I never knew Wolfgang. I, I knew John Varda very well, and I knew the Gordon Mounts of Florida even better. And there were other people around there, and, and Alan Watts, and uh, Harry Parts, and uh, who else you may want to... Well, that's, that's wonderful. Some of those people, some of those people when they were very young were involved with the Black Hat Cafe, and that, that was more in the late 30s and right to the edge of Pearl Harbor. It was um, the building still there, Knesset building in, in, in North Beach. And that was a, uh, uh, a real bohemian cafe run by a Swiss guy. And there was a, a younger guy who hung out there named Henry Lenoir who opened Vesuvio. Right. So that, and and uh, that, that's a great tradition. Uh, but I think Varda hung out at the Black Hat a little. Uh, the Black Hat was a dive. Yeah, and Jimmy Brown when he was very young. <laughs> Absolutely. Lou Harrison, some of Lou those Lou Harrison, right. Which means that Park's going to have been too far away. No, Lou, Lou and Harry were friends and liked each other, which was unusual for composers at that time. I know Miller, the reason I know about Varda is through Henry Miller. And he loved him and he paints this, as he does with the people he loved, he paints this larger than life kind of character, bellicose and what was he like? His paintings are beautiful, they're stunning, I think. Yeah, I mean, they're, and most of, a lot of them are collages. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Henry, uh, you know, Henry was an appreciator. I knew Henry in New York, mm -hmm. and I knew Henry in Big Sur. And uh, Henry in New York had volumes of correspondence with a man named Michael Frankel, who wrote books called Bastard Death, if you could believe that. <laughs> and he had a group of people who wore poison rings. Uh, always wore the poison rings in case they had to go do it, you know, and they never did. You know? and, and among those people we were affiliated with Israel and the Sternus gang, and we bought a boat to move refugees from Europe to Israel, which, which unfortunately got caught by the British who put all the people. Uh, I, I, I lost a lot for, to be on the boat, but everybody went to Acre prison. And the boat was called the Ben Hecht. And the reason it was called the Ben Hecht is because the guy who gave most of the money for us to buy the boat was Harpo Marx. And Harpo <laughs> says, you cannot call that boat the Harpo Marx, which we are attempting to do. He says, Groucho hates anything to do with Israel, and I need Groucho very much so that I can't afford you. <laughs> so the second guy who gave the second most money was Bebek. So that was the name of the boat, which got seized by the British. Hmm. Well, you know, um, so you, you knew Henry Miller. That's just, I mean, that's just amazing to me. And the closest I got to him was Bukowski, and I went up to his house because he had written about Bukowski. He said he liked his work, and we went to the house in Beverly Glen, and we knocked on the door, and we heard footsteps, and the next thing I know, Bukowski had went and was hiding in the car. And, <laughs> and, I, and then I took off, and I had to pound on it for him to open it, and he sped off, and... He just he decided he was too embarrassed. Uh, but I, I want to say something at this point. I told my, my friend Raymond Foy, who's a uh, he's edited books for New Direction, City Lights, and uh, Black Sparrow, and uh, he's an art 
person in New York, and he said, oh, you're interviewing Gerd. He said, uh, there's no problem there. Just ask him a question, and he'll go on for two hours. <laughs> but he has it. He's just, I mean, <laughs> you know. Hey, I was he also only said, at 45 minutes. <laughs> He also said it would have been a good two hours, so it's a, it's a it's, it's great the way it is, but it was just so clear and so lucid, and uh, man, all those trips we were both on, and look at us, we're, we're so clear, you know. And, That's uh, right. Clear so, was a good word. You know? Somebody said, what were the acid trips like? I said, 30 years later, they were wonderful. Because <laughs> they are, they, they inform you. Uh, tell me, um, uh, Harry Smith is somebody I uh, admire so much and, and got to know a bit, and uh, I know you knew him. Can you tell a Harry Smith thing or two? I don't know if everyone knows him. He's, you can look him up on the web. He's a great filmmaker, wonderful poet, and uh, in the end, he was sort of babysat by Allen Ginsberg because he had nowhere to go, and, and uh, Bob Dylan worshipped him. He did the anthology of folk music in the 40s. It was a pioneering work. Now there's a, uh, the Getty has a uh, very huge Harry Smith archive. Mm -hmm. If only Harry was alive to enjoy the benefits of that. But anyway, could you talk about him a bit? Yeah, well, I first met Harry uh, in the Fillmore at uh, Jimbo's Bop City, right, mm -hmm. with Philip Lamantia. And uh, he introduced me to Harry, and Harry said, you guys have to come with me to see some of my artwork, you know, so. And he had a deal at Jimbo's Bob City where he had made a mural on the walls, which was quite a fantastic mural. And the deal was that for the rest of his life he would have cassava melons every day and whether it was in season or not and, and, and when I met him he was chomping on a cassava melon and so he takes us about three doors next to a, a hotel in the, right in the middle of the Fillmore uh, which most of you know what that neighborhood is, a uh, very difficult black neighborhood in San Francisco. And he says, uh, you have to take your shoes off and you have to keep quiet, not one sound, and I will take you and you just do what I tell you. So we follow him, we take our shoes off, and it turns out he opens the door and he's got a flashlight and he points out things on the floor, three pieces of art and they're, they're kind of very complex and, and not easy to understand. And he, he does it with the flashlight, mm -hmm. and not very long, and then we have to go out. And <laughs> I say, what is this about, Harry? He says, you don't understand. On either side of me are black prostitutes. They both work for the FBI, and they're trying to get me busted. Whoa. So I figure, paranoia, right? I mean, what else would you think? And he was extremely paranoid. And he, he was only the second most terrifying right. person that I've ever met. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, further on, we're doing a uh, uh, psychedelic theater in New York. And uh, uh, Timothy Leary and I agree that nobody's going to get in for free this time. Although the habit is everybody gets in free and everything in those days. And I say, okay, that's the deal. And Harry comes barging in and he says, I know all these people and nobody's going to make me pay five bucks to get in here. Uh, and I look at Timothy and I pull out my wallet and I say, 
Tim, here's five bucks for Harry because if we don't let him in, he's going to make trouble. <laughs> and Harry was a terrible troublemaker. And he was violent and abusive. And he used the dirtiest words he could possibly use. Uh, and uh, so he got in and he still made a lot of trouble during the <laughs> performances. Well, mostly because Timothy was one of the most boring speakers that you ever heard. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, when we did our multimedia piece, we had this tape which was given to me from the Radio Fusion Francaise of Antonin Artaud screaming when he was in the uh, mental hospital. And we blew that as Timothy was speaking, and finally Ralph <laughs> Metzen came back to the control booth. He says, you're breaking your contracts. But we just laughed, and we kept blowing you. <laughs> Timothy was not happy, but what the hell. You know, uh, it was our option. So that's Harry. Yeah. Uh, when I first met, tell you a little bit about Harry Smith, very quick anecdote. When, I went up to his hotel room. I had never met him before, this is 25, 30 years ago, and knocked on the door and came in. There's a little canary, and I said, what a beautiful canary. You want to see the father? He opened up the freezer. <laughs> there was a, and then there was a stack of papers on the table. I said, what's that? He said, that's hopscotch patterns of the world. And it was. It was 200 sheets of where he had written down very meticulously all the hopscotch patterns and the cultures all over the world. There was also a, the biggest collection of magic books I ever saw in this little tiny room. So that was Harry. As for Philip Lamantia, born in San Francisco in 1927. Yes. Uh, most of his books from City Lights, although his first book was published by Byrne Porter in right. Berkeley in 49. Did you know Byrne? He was, no, I didn't. Uh, he was I about know. 18. I know Byrne he, very well. You, know, you should all go out and Go out immediately and pick up a book by uh, Philip Lamadia. Once you bought the books that I brought here in this little case, um, <laughs> can you talk a little bit about Philip and, and that group? Hey, I first came to San Francisco in the 1940s, and about the second <clears throat> night, I went to a poetry reading and at the San Francisco Museum of uh, Modern Art, which at that time was in the civic, civic center, you know. And two of the poets there were Bill Everson, who later became Brother Antoninus, oh, yeah. and Philip <coughs> Lamantia. And I enjoyed Philip's poems, so I went up to him and introduced myself, and we became friends, and we remained friends until he died, which was not that long ago. Uh, I knew his father, who was a produce dealer in the Crystal Palace market, where Philip worked with him for quite a while. I knew his mother, who was a great Italian cook, uh, and uh, I enjoyed a number of dinners, and uh, we were together in all kinds of ways, Philip and I. In fact, one horrible week of my life was spent helping him kick heroin in Woodstock, which he was grateful to me for the rest of his life. Mm. And he was very good about that, but it didn't stop him from returning to it, you know, so <laughs> it wasn't as helpful as he thought it was, <laughs> or that I thought it was. Though it was a horrible week because, uh, you know, it's not easy for people to do that even if they're willing to do it. And he, he was a great poet, no doubt about that. And he, he had some lovely experiences with various women. His last wife was Nancy Peters, who is part owner of City Lights and who was publisher for many, many years, and who has been working on books of her own. Uh, so, Philip 
you know, he returned to Catholicism toward the end of his life, uh, which he grew up with, and he took it very seriously. And, uh, you know, it's, it's been an interesting relationship between Jews and Catholics in the avant-garde and in poetry and art mm -hmm. all the way through. And uh, um, I was a very close friend of Marshall McLuhan's who was also an extremely pious Catholic. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because I, as I was looking at the paintings earlier, I realized that Philip had introduced me to a lot of the names, and you know, Gordon Onslow Ford, uh, Palin, and uh, Mata, and uh, some of the others. These are people that, that Philip either knew or he loved their work. Uh, uh, Philip introduced me to Gordon Onslow Ford and his wife, yeah. Jacqueline. That's a, yeah. Because some of these paintings by Onslow Ford, I've never seen the one on the, they're, they're just, I mean, to me, they're just magnificent mm -hmm. works. And he, he, uh, he took himself very seriously as a painter, you know, uh, and he was good at it. And uh, he, he was a, a student and a, into Zen in, in that middle years during the Zen period in San Francisco when Roshi Baker, who's still a good friend of mine, mm. was the head of the Zen until he got into kind of a scandal. And uh, Gordon studied with the uh, calligraphers and uh, with Suzuki Roshi, and uh, he was able to gain a lot of that and ch change the styles of his paintings as a result of his studies. Uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, Allen Ginsberg and Carl Solomon and when you met them, I think it was in a mental hospital. Uh, uh, you uh, met Solomon first, Carl? Yeah, I, I, I was in the psychiatric institute because I had been living with a poet named John Hoffman on the streets in a burned out Willie's car. And um, my uncle, the doctor, got upset. And uh, I wound up with a psychiatrist who told me that my father couldn't afford him, uh, but that he had a great idea for me because he said I was malnourished. So if I went to this place up at the, in, Psychiatric Institute called PI, uh, and told them that I was doing something dangerous to myself. They were interested in uh, interesting people in the arts, and they would take me in, and I would get fed. So I did it, and uh, it was uh, kind of bizarre. I mean, I was in a ward with about twenty twenty-five people of uh, various ages and various conditions. Uh, none of them seemed really uh, mad in the, you know, any kind of a violent way. Everybody was very peaceful. But here we were locked in and fed and uh, in rows of beds, I mean, it was all in a big room. And uh, about 10 days later, though, this guy walked into the room. He was all in blue, blue shirt, dark blue, dark blue pants, blue suede shoes. And under his arms were stacks of books on both sides, which as he walked into the room, he dropped and stuck out his hand and said, Carl Solomon. And I said, Geert Stern. He said, define your terms. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we became friends. And, uh, he, he explained to me that he had just gotten off of 
boat that he was working on from Paris, and all these books were books that he bought in Paris. And, wow, they were people I'd never even heard of. I mean, Jean Genet, uh, Celine, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, uh, we became friends immediately, and we, we had a good time together uh, at the expense of the nurses and the doctors. <laughs> um, and not long after, probably another week or ten days, this other guy comes walking in the door, and he says, Ginsburg. And, and What's your first name? Alan. I said, we'll call you Al. He says, nobody calls me Al. <laughs> it's either Alan or Ginsburg. <laughs> so, Colin, I thought he was very funny, so we started having a trio, and we, we uh, were mischievous with the, with the nurses. You got to play ping pong. The male nurse, who was a good ping pong player, we we do four people playing him, and we always changed ourselves as we went along. And when we when he was losing, we'd make him win, and when he was winning, we'd make him lose. So <laughs> it didn't uh, really. He. he uh, uh, eventually was taken away mad because uh, Carl went into the bathroom uh, with a, a paper mache bunny uh, and brought it out and uh, put it on the table and it leaked white miscus liquid and the, the, the main nurse asked him, what's that? He says, what do you think it was that I went into the bathroom and did. <laughs> uh, and the guy started screaming. Oh, and no. They, they brought out a straitjacket and took him away. <laughs> this is a true story. Oh, my God. You know, uh, anyway, and, and Carl was like that. I mean, in later years, we were this, uh, he was married to a woman. And he and Alan had all these problems, but uh, because of how. Uh, but that was later. But in the meantime, at the San Remo, we're there, and the blind man walks in and uh, comes to the bar and says, could you take me to the men's room? And Carl says, of course. And he walks off and takes him and comes back to the bar. And I said, Carl, that is so unlike you to be so nice. He says, what are you talking about? I took him to the ladies' room. <laughs> <laughs> That's where that was called. Did, did you keep up with Ginsburg over the years, friendship? Oh yeah, we were we were friends. We were friends, but we also disagreed about a lot of things. And eventually, he really screwed around with me very badly uh, because of the Neil's letter, which he had given to me. Uh, to send to Carl, which I did, and Carl returned it, and I knew he returned it because I had a list. They, the only thing they took was Junkie, which they published, because that was Carl's uncle, A.A. A. Wynn. And uh, for over 50 years, I was accused in many literary magazines uh, by Alan's story that <laughs> I had dropped it off my barge because I disliked Neil, which is true, I did dislike Neil, and I disliked <laughs> Jack also. Jack was a terrible alcoholic, and Neil was a uh, raving con man, but, you know, that is, didn't mean I didn't know them, I knew them both. And, and, and Alan took that very badly, and when he published Howell, or uh, Larry Ferling published Howell, uh, Carl's uncle A.A. A. Wynn fired him because there was an intimation in the poem that Carl had fucked his mother, which wasn't true, but it was an intimation which bothered his mother powerfully, and, 
and then his uncle even more. His uncle was his mother's brother. Right. So, you know, that lasted for over 50 years, mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden, it appears, supposedly the only copy, and I'm vindicated, mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> and the pictures which my friend Judith took of me and, and all over the world, <laughs> and I'm vindicated, big fucking deal. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but it just felt good. You know? yeah. I will admit that. You know? mm-hmm. it, it was not pleasant to be perjured about because yeah. I'm not the kind of person who would throw even somebody's work that I didn't like away because I value yeah. creativity in all its yeah. forms and that's why I'm here. If anyone knows, the letter we're referring to is is uh, that uh, is it that Kerouac had written to Cassidy? Is that, I forget now. Cassidy yeah, had written to Cassidy. Kerouac. Cassidy had written to Kerouac. Yeah, and Alan considered it a masterpiece. His Holiness had dubbed it a, and uh, that that's the letter they're referring to. And it wasn't. Yeah, I've heard about it for years. If it's any comfort, when Alan first met me, he said, "You're fat." And I said, you're bald. <laughs> and uh, we had a difficult relationship ever since. That time. And that's what I, that I had with him. He, uh, he was a difficult person, no doubt about that. I knew his father, who was uh, also a poet, and he was a really sweet man. And I never knew his mother, but I think the poem that he wrote about his mother, Kaddish, is the best poem he ever wrote. Oh, my Jesus. Yeah, you know, um, that's, a, that's a very strange now to think of you gone without corsets and those starts like that. Eh? You know, and it's, it's, it's a great day. Yeah, you know, in old age, there's a poem uh, about his mother's ghost uh, that he wrote, and I, I thought it was also uh, a very great poem. And incidentally, there's one to Carl Solomon. Uh, these are two poems that, uh, in, the, in the last poems that were put out after his death. There's a great poem to Carl, to your old buddy Carl. It's, uh, it's it is. It's a good poem. You're you're right. I mean, uh, and uh, he he never got over the fact that Carl was really pissed at him about how. Yeah. Uh, and Carl had every good reason to be pissed about how, uh, because uh, uh, it's dedicated to him, and he didn't. You know, he, he wound up. In, for the second time in a mental institution, and Carl was not crazy, you know. Neither was Alan, but neither was I, you know. <laughs> but it's very odd when when you're in a mental institution and you're behind locked doors. How'd you, know? you get out? Yeah, tell them why you got uh, Why did, did I get out? Okay, <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, uh, Carl and I had both been pot smokers, but Alan had never smoked grass. I got out for the weekends. Neither of them got out because they were considered dangerous, <laughs> uh, which is why they were offered uh, electric shock, which Carl took and he mm. appreciated. It. Alan didn't take it. And I wasn't even offered it, thank God. <laughs> but uh, I, I stored some grass and brought a couple of joints into the hospital and Alan got high for the first time. And they had been reading John Janae and Janae, as some of you may recall, had, had, there was an episode where he was part of a gang of uh, kind of quasi-criminals and he turned them in to the police in France. And they, they used that as a model for turning me into the uh, doctors and administrators <laughs> of the hospital, and they threw me out. <laughs> and, uh, I, I was kind of ready to go. Anyway. <laughs> really? And th- they had to stay. I thought it was pretty funny at the time. Uh, and my psychiatrist, who I really liked a lot, said to me, You know, we're not never going to see each other again, and this is the last time. Mm. And uh, I'm a Freudian, and you have read Freud, so you know all about we listen, we don't give advice. 
but I'm going to give you some advice anyway. <laughs> and that advice is you can't live both the life that you want to live and the life that your father wants you to live. So you better make up your mind fast. And I did. Immediately. Wow. And here I am. All right. <laughs> well, speaking of the asylum, I just finished the book, The Bug House, about uh, Ezra Pound. He spent 15 years, as some of you may know, in the St. Elizabeth's Asylum. I, I visited him there twice. I knew it. I just <laughs> How did I know it? Was the Philip Lovett there? Oh, no. Philip went and visited him? Yes, He mom. never told me. Never would tell me that. No, 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 no. And, you know, very quickly, of course, there's theories that Pound was put there so they didn't have to try him for treason. That's right. The other is that he really was. They diagnosed him as a megalomaniac. He was there 15 years. And not only did uh, Gerd and Philip visit, I, I was just speaking to uh, Diane de Prima, and she was telling me about her many visits to Ezra Pound. And here she is. She's a very left-wing radical poet. Um, and uh, he was visited many times by T.S. Eliot, of course, Nobel Prize winner, by, by uh, uh, Frost, by Hemingway, by Archibald MacLeish, wow. by William Faulkner. And finally, because all these people petitioned, they finally let him out. And uh, he just felt that America was the asylum. <laughs> and that he was the same one. Uh, and he went back to Europe. Yeah. So what, you know, it's a little a field thing, but what was it like visiting him? Well, he, he, he had a very comfortable scene at uh, St. Elizabeth with his wife, who was there daily, and he had all the food that he wanted, and uh, I mean, he, he, he felt like uh, he was in a good hotel. Uh, but he, wasn't, he wasn't complaining at all. Uh, and, but what, what you said is true. He was accused of treason and his uh, work with the Italian uh, fascists and Mussolini uh, were proof of his uh, treason. So he, some of that accusations were appropriate. Uh, maybe it was a kind of a stupid thing to do with a guy like him who who wrote the cantos and who was uh, known well as uh, as a creative artist, but uh, hey, he had his opinions and uh, they, they had, a, had a political impact. And he did wind up for 15 years in the asylum, yeah. sure which is not what a pleasant place to be, even though he seemed to enjoy it. <laughs> and Alan, Alan went to visit him with Orlovsky in, in the 60s and in Venice where he was living with his uh, Olga Rudge and, uh, and uh, he apologized to Alan for what he said my stupid suburban anti-Semitism and Alan accepted him and he, and he read him some poems and played Bob Dylan for him and Dylan had no response so uh, Anyway, so we're sitting here and I'm feeling like I'm, that we're two uh, Talmudic scholars in some ancient Babylon or something. Um, uh, tell me... Um, you go to Babylon as long as you're That's right. right. You're damn right. I could go on for two hours. <laughs> Listen, Gerd, your poetry. Could you talk about poetry in your life and also the visual poetry? And with that, it seems to me you did a lot of collaboration which I find fascinating with other people in the arts. So those are a couple other... Yeah, we, we, a number of times we had communes and collaborations. When I was on the barge, uh, we had a group called Seven Straight Cats. Um, <laughs> that was myself and my wife, Anne London, who was a poet. Jack Gilbert, who was a quite well-known yeah. poet. Yeah. And I have that with me, and uh, I'll read yeah. one oh, poem yeah. of mine, and I should read one poem of Jack Gilbert's. Mm. Uh, this poem, I'll take off my glasses so I can read, it's called After Image. When I struck down, and this is from the, 
from that time, the 1950s, when I'm struck down by a rod or my soft mummy mate was laid in the mimic twitch of pick and knock by all who would, who didn't find me wandering when the stranger curves inside were margins for my sibling pain? My last and always swore when I struck down to find by vain the pool and rock, the core, a cry, cry for next and last again. When is a time and where a place I can't go on to find by name is nothing but the same dumb, easy source of faith in glass. When I struck down my image, then the roots took fire, my years grew scattered, few and in between, I took the fast and hollow slide. Don was it where I am to count the drops of glass. I know the nervous fist that struck me down. Mm. Wow. 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 Thank you. I don't know. Did you want to do another? I'll do one of Jack Gilbert's, yes. Collected poems about two weeks ago. Wonderful book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where is it? Or maybe you'll find one of your own on the way. Um, well, that's okay. I have another one of mine, but I, I'd like to do one of um, cats. See, it's seven straight cats <laughs> reading their poems. 25 cents. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's online the now. It's the first edition. Huh? It's an online edition for twenty five hundred dollars. Yeah. Really? <laughs> he's supposed to be at the end, but he's not. <laughs> yeah. What a good news. It's everybody but Jack. Isn't that odd? Are you going to read something too? I could. Uh, oh, by Jack in Gilbert. A V E is the name of it. Tree of flesh, tree of silk, garden of linen, house of flesh, garden of giving, forest of yielding, forest of damask, tree of rain, stream of iris, river of yielding, sweet tree of singing, Pentecost, Pentecost, the forty velvet weeping archangels of only this once, elm of flesh, maple of spirit, and the caterpillar of time, multiplying this beauty to it must be now to epiphany, epiphany among the forty velvet weeping archangels of love. Oh yeah. <laughs> nice. So so poet so poetry is the great at least to me, poetry is always the great stream that uh, even though to the public it's a trickle. I think to us it's, a, it's this great un unending river, you know. And, uh, uh, it's how I look at it. And flowing, yes, it flows. And the uh, stream is an image that uh, has uh, assonance, uh, whether it's E E or E A or. English is a wonderful language in that the letters of, the, of a word can vary and, uh, you know, my, my mantra, the last line of which goes, 
take the then out of now. I mean, yeah. then, yeah, okay, yeah. The then is the only word, the only language in English, English where then means both past and future. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, oh. uh, you know that's a wonderful oh. possibility in a language that you can have two opposites confluent. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know other languages well enough to have spotted that same thing happen. Well, you know, in Hebrew, of course, the uh, classical thing to do is to meditate on single letters and the importance of, like the importance of the olive as the first letter and that the olive turned upside down as a staghorn. I mean, and, and uh, and, and Beth is like a house, it's even shaped like it. All these, and they have various numerical values, as you know, and, and it plays a very big role in, uh, in uh, Kabbalah, Kabbalah uh, but also individual words and how we, how we uh, work with, wor with words, you know. Like I, I meditated on the, on the first words of the Bible in Hebrew and what the meaning is. Because it says it says Elohim, which is a plural, and the, and the Talmudic scholars often said, well, it's because it's God the Father, God the Judge, God the Maker, God the Brother, and, and all these different things that God is. So, but others say it was a, a remnant of the plural. Well, you know, they didn't say El, which is a single. They said Elohim. So, and and Philip and I, Lama T and I, would talk about those matters and he would get very excited yeah, about was, individual words and what they mean and especially as a latter day surrealist you know he would he would do that he, he was uh, a very conscious metaphysical poet there was no doubt about that and uh, he was a pleasure to talk with about those subjects and uh, that wasn't what his reputation was he, he, his lifestyle in San Francisco was uh, much opposite to what his poetry consisted of, and the way the way he lived. Uh, um, but you know, his Catholicism was apparently very vital into to his. Consciousness, and uh, I, I met the two priests that he was involved with toward the end of his life. He introduced me to them because they were so important to him. And that's that's a beautiful church in North Beach that he uh, grew up with and came back to. Yeah, well, it, it was a beautiful return for him. To something he had he had rejected and. And also, death was approaching, and and it gave him something, frankly, to to hold on to, and to have some kind of uh, hope in. What about the visual poetry you did? How does that play in? You did these, these beautiful mandala type things. Hey, you know, it seemed to me at one point in my life, it took me until my forties, kind of for me to realize that my voice as a poet was something that I could recognize and value as th that's really who I was. And then to take the words and make them visual seemed like a, a great liberation. And I was fortunate to have friends who were in the arts, painters and sculptors, and who persuaded me to do that kind of work and to show them in galleries oh, yeah. and to introduce me to the people who, who started showing me. And uh, I've been doing that ever since, and I've shown all over the world yeah. with uh, visualized words and, and poetry. And, uh, The mandala uh, is a very conducive uh, form uh, for circular poetry. <laughs> uh, 
it is possible that it is possible. <laughs> hey, take the no out of now. Well, well, that's it. Those, those, I think those visual poems, the ones that go around in the circle, yeah. and the words upside down, it, it just, it takes poetry to other places, and, and it makes everything possible. It's just another stream. Hey. Hey, uh, the recognition that you voice is uh, very important to me that somebody uh, is able to uh, express that and, and it, it, it's a conjunction and a feeling of uh, comradeship which uh, we seem to have achieved uh, for the first time sitting across this mm -hmm. very little distance from each <laughs> other. Uh, I mean, here, here we've been in the same world that we have talked about for decades and we've never known each other. Oh, really? Oh. So uh, here we are. So if you'd like, you ask if I'd read, I'll read something. I'll read yes. one. Right. It, it'll be appropriate. I hope so. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, you see. And I believe this is so. for Lawrence, uh -huh. who I've been, uh, when I first came to San Francisco, I was working for George Moscone uh -huh. as a publicist and uh, wow. all it took was a couple of visits to North Beach and I was gone. Uh -huh. <laughs> and they knew it and so they sort of booted me out. But the last time I saw George was he was going into the Tunnel of Love on Broadway. It was one of those girly joints that Neely, come and see us and he waved. And Two weeks later, he was uh, assassinated. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's my uh, now. I gotta find. It. There's a there's a uh, index to this, huh. which should say Frulinghetti in it. Uh, or I could do Don Kingman, which is a very. Huh. Did you know him? Uh, I I know who he was. Yes. yes. Where is this, uh, this is the worst thing you can do, I know, but there are not that many poems in this book. <laughs> <laughs> Good God, and there's an index. So I guess I'm going to read, uh, since my eyes are so bad, I read the one to uh, Don Kingman, which is, did you know Bob Kaufman? Very well. Oh, God. He burned me. <laughs> Progress. <laughs> okay, so I am. Um, he did what to you? You'll burned, never forget. He burned John Hoffman and I for an ounce of grass. Wow. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but I knew him as part from that. Um, uh, he was he was not a great friend because he he was always on the take. Bobby was. Yes. But he's a great poet. Yeah, he's a good poet. Yeah. Okay, well maybe I shouldn't read the book. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm editing the uh, collected poems with Raymond Foy of Bob Kaufman, and uh, we're sort of pulled between City Lights, who wants it, and <clears throat> New Directions, who would like to have it. How about, uh, oh, I'll read the Kingman. I can't find the Fernley Getty. Okay. Don Kingman was a watercolor artist. Some of you know the name. Some people, you know, he did the, all the sets for the Flower Drum song and uh, stuff like that. And uh, C.Y. Lee. Yeah, and a lot of cover time and this one and that one. And uh, was a big part of uh, the Black Cat Cafe scene. Why is this happening? Why can you not find a... <laughs> That's your book. Because you uh, don't have that. We you can find like it. For like for a lot. So. <laughs> I should give it to somebody. Oh, I found, ah, for Lingetti at 97. <laughs> okay. Okay. Strolling down Columbus Avenue to Little Joe's Restaurant, where we'd sit right before the flames, Lawrence in Greek sailor cap, my beret folded in pocket. This is 1975. There will be heavy rain soon enough. Maria takes orders for lamb chops. 
the older cook will soon retire and return home to Italy. He places his cook's palm on one burner, high enough not to burn himself. Flames rise. Lawrence breaks into a smile and turns the decades into a sentiment of words that ring across San Francisco Bay, out to the open sea. For Linghetti, a woman says, and he answers, no, I'm his twin brother. The real one is at the bookstore hiding behind a secret door. The lights go on way up on Walt Whitman's cloud where he continues to dispense wisdom and sleight of hand while we eat. Later we are walking again and he hands me the keys to his Bixby Canyon cabin. No endless coffee houses there, he grins. You have to make hobo coffee over the fire in the open pit. Then he is 97 years old, still the golden glow of a man who landed on Normandy and surveyed the fields of Nagasaki. Still he wanders the streets near Notre Dame and hides out in Mexico and asks Apollinaire to visit. The French poet shows up 41 years later and takes a seat in what is now a Mycenaean dining hall where Edgar Allan Poe coaxes a raven from the wood. A Coney Island of the Mind was one of the books I used to hide underneath a school notebook. Lawrence is 97. The USA is a few decades older. It is 2016, and we need poetry more than ever in the heartless void that has settled. Yeah, we offer gratitude, if only for the cabin and city lights, easy as massive as the Borges Library, the Library of Babel, Endless Hand, Endless Fire. So, so you know, Lawrence and Gurd share that, just that great, I mean, it's not a commitment, but it is a commitment to, to a, a different kind of lifestyle, a different way of seeing an alternative way of being in this uh, thing we live in, this uh, machine we live in. There's a, there's a line in Howell, you know, where Alan says, the starry dynamo and the machinery of night. Uh-huh. And, and I think of that as an uh, incredible sign of hope. I told Alan that once uh, when he was doing his cranky uncle routine. <laughs> I quoted that to him, and he was very appreciative of that and uh, so I have to say Gerd if you don't mind without lapsing in a sentimentality I, I feel that you've uh, that you've kept the light going by just being everywhere and, and, and so accomplished and, and working with so many other people and it's a, it's a great history and there's a beautiful uh, a beautiful oral history with Gerd online that you can read uninterrupted by my voice or any other voice <laughs> but your own. And it's so beautiful because it's uh, it, it's such a map of, of the territory. You know, you know Furley Getty's first book, Pictures of the Gone World. Uh-huh. You know, we all have that. We all have those gone worlds. And uh, I must say my, my parents were part of the black cat scene in the 30s and early 40s. And, uh, and they left because of the war, and my father never forgave himself and could never come back. And I always felt my coming back was a way of fulfilling his thing, you know. And he lived in 97, you know. So, uh, but he, North Beach was gold, you know. Well, we, would, we would visit now and then. Um, so, so what about that? You're in, you're in New York. Raymond Foy tells me, don't live far from the Chelsea, is that true? There's so much to do still there? Well, actually, I live in two places uh, on the weekends in Chelsea with Judith. And during the week in Cresco, New Jersey, in the house that I own. And uh, 
for various reasons. Um, at my age, I'm figuring that I can't do what I used to do like I did, but I keep doing it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I like, that's a great line. <laughs> that's great. Well, it's a conundrum. That's a wonderful word, conundrum, right? Uh, but, you know, being here with you and sharing all of those synchronicities that we have in our lives, um, the, all of those contacts, and, you know, the, uh, my, one of my major works which is an octagon originally seven feet in diameter called Contact is the Only Love. Um, you know, it, it expresses what the sentiment is. And uh, I just wonder where we go from here. Uh, now, when I knew Larry Furling and his wife Kirby, Okay. You know, that was a whole different world. I, I do not know Lamb Sperling Getty at 97 or 98. For good reasons, probably. There is good reasons, they're not mine. Yeah. I, I, I have no problem reacquainting, for instance, there's someone here, Stuart Brand, who I haven't seen for decades and who we happen to share a lot of, to, at least to me, and I think probably to him, important experiences together uh, as part of a group of people, again, a commune, uh, a collaborationist, USCO, and at a time when Stuart and his wife at the time, Lois, were talking about America needs Indians, mm -hmm. and you know, that incredible catalog which appeared uh, out of their consciousnesses. Yeah. And I was, I think, fortunate in introducing you to John Brockman, <laughs> who, who's another name that uh, keeps appearing through the decades uh, as a literary agent who God knows whom, mostly scientists, but uh, mm. also creative people. And, uh, you know, so the past, in a way you can say, and that's a cliche, the past is too much with us. Mm. However, if it wasn't the past that brought us to events of this kind, what would it be? Mm -hmm. you know, mm. It's your wow. past and my past that gets us sitting here. You know, and, <laughs> yeah. and it, it takes somebody to recognize it. Now, this museum, which is not familiar to me at all, has provided not only the physical venue, but the conscious this that includes what we've done here and what we mm -hmm. may do there or here, whatever here there is. Yes. But, you know, uh, what can you predict? Uh, and it's very different. It, it's easy, it was easy to predict in 1936 when I came to this country and, you know, I became an American, you know, and, uh, and refugees are very good patriots. Why? Because we escaped from something, and the paranoia that is generated by that uh, is very creatively driving one hmm. to understand that being here is some privilege which exists in the world, you know, and uh, despite the negative, despite the positive, mm. despite not understanding who we are and, and what we're doing, 
uh, we are able to cope with it and to make it work for us. And here we are, and the Lord is alive. You know, <laughs> what else could you say but alive? And love. Yeah, that's, that's so, so beautifully put. And then, uh, you know, this morning I got an uh, email from a friend in Petaluma, Susan Coolidge. I don't know if any, any of you know the poet Clark Coolidge. He's a, he's a very great poet. And he's from back east, and uh, he started the patron saint of the language poets who sort of took over academia. But I said, she said, I, we don't think we're going to be able to make it today to uh, Sonoma. And I said, why? She said, because Clark's busy correcting the manuscript of Poet. Poet is 300 pages, mostly sonnets. And he's 79 years old. And I, I was just thinking, pretty young, right? But I was thinking, wow. <laughs> how, how, I mean, to me, it's just incredible in this world today in this world today. I'm amazed at 73 that I, I'm doing what, exactly what I did when I was 12, which is write poetry. <laughs> and not much else, you know. And, uh, and I've been fortunate to be able to do that, but that made me so happy for Clark and I forgave him for not, of course you shouldn't come, you should, you should correct a manuscript. And he's a big, tall, well-dressed guy and he reads all over the place, Harvard, Oxford, Syracuse, whatever, you know, he's very well-placed, but there he is just in the saddle working every day. And I, I think that's, especially in this, I won't say it, in this thing we live in now. So, so it's been a, it's, it's a great thing. How are we doing on time? I'm only concerned about. Huh? Uh, We're what? Ask if there's any questions and then um, we can ask some questions after that. Questions. Uh, questions. Questions and wrap oh, it up. Oh, God yes. Almighty! Yes, question. <laughs> yes, question. Yes, question. <laughs> okay, we have time for questions, please. And if you want a microphone, I can yeah. give you one. Uh, you touched on uh, Bern Porter in Sausalito. He was kind of a catalyst in Sausalito for that era. And the Tides Bookstore. Can you talk about that a little bit? Bern Porter yeah. was a fascinating being. I don't know if you know his history. Byrne was one of the people who was in the atomic bomb project as a very unclear whether he had a scientific enough background, but he had a scientific role in it. He felt extremely guilty about that uh, uh, experience, and as a result, he started publishing poetry, you know, which <laughs> is bizarre. And he had a network of connections, and he did some beautiful work. I met him, yes on my barge in Sausalito. He was a very close friend of Richard Wirtz Emerson, who uh, had audio recorded practically every poet of the United States. And unfortunately, all those recordings were lost when he became homeless and alcoholic. But Bern, uh, I, <laughs> I drove Bern Porter's mother from Sausalito to Philadelphia <laughs> in her car <laughs> uh, because she was elderly and couldn't drive herself and he asked me if I would do it and I wanted to go back to New York so it was a you know great deal and it was an interesting thing and she was totally aware of his history with the Atomic Bomb Project which Mostly, he didn't even touch on with anybody because he, he felt so badly about it. But uh, she talked about it, and she knew how he had this guilt trip going, and she disliked it a lot. Um, anyway, so that's mm -hmm. my knowledge of Bernd Porter. 
And he was an interesting looking person. Uh, uh, he, he was, How many books did he do? Yeah. Oh, lots of books. Right, right. But, uh, Fill up the course is one. Yeah, and he supposedly did a, a version of my first book, and he, he did them in copy, copy. I've never seen it, so I don't know if he actually did it. He promised to do it. But, uh, you know, he, uh, he had lots of friends at the poetry. There's a question here, and then you're next. <laughs> you have to go ahead of the story. You're, you're, <laughs> um, can you talk a little more about Jean Bar? I grew up in Sausalito, and he was a big figure when I was a kid. And can you talk a little bit more about where he fit into the pantheon of the poets and artists and musicians? John. Varda. 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 Oh, Varda. Oh, yeah. Yanko. <laughs> Yanko, we all call him. Yes, I remember that. Hey, he was uh, a spark plug, and he knew everybody because he had spent so much time in Paris. And that's where he knew Gordon Oslo Ford, which is how he got to be on the bar, on the ferry boat. Uh, and he, he, he was a very active person. He, he was painting all the time. And uh, he welcomed people on the, the weekends on the boat. Uh, I mean, anybody who was anybody was on that boat once or twice. I was on it often. Uh, and, uh, he, he was married a number of times. The last to a young painter who he met in, when he went back to Greece uh, named Chrysa, who uh, turned out to be not to be very nice to him, but who made quite a reputation for herself. I taught her how to do neon, and she uh, used it quite profusely. <laughs> uh, but uh, she, she was bad to Yanko. Uh, was, 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 in your opinion, was the um, regard for Varda in the 50s, uh, when he was on the Valhalla, for his, the people he gathered and the women around him, or was it for his art as well? Well, he was, uh, he, he was married, what, I think three times at least. Uh, and he had a daughter who he was very fond Rania. of. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he was a family person, mm -hmm. and he was a very friendly person. Mm -hmm. I mean, I considered him a close friend, and I, I, don't, I don't know how he considered me, but, <laughs> you know, Harry Parch was someone that he knew very well. I, I mean, Alan Watts and all of those people, not, not to talk about Gordon uh, and Jacqueline, but um, he was the captain of that boat, and that boat still exists. And if, it, if, if, if it, you know, somebody actually put a new hull on the Vallejo, mm -hmm. uh, the, I think the person who now owns it. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, certainly his memory is redolent in that boat. And uh, even though I, I don't know that any of his paintings still hang in the boat, maybe they do. Uh, there are people who have his paintings. I'm not one of them. Yeah. I am. <laughs> you love them? Yeah. I, we, we, I grew up in Sausalito, and my family, we've had one for 70 years. Wow. It's kind of faded, but it's a clock. <laughs> yeah, he was a great, great character. Uh, I'll turn around, Steve. I'm getting back to him. Um, <laughs> Garrett, you're an unusually bicoastal artist. <laughs> <laughs> and... The artists I mostly hung with are not the ones you're referring to, because it's a different generation. But the ones I saw in the 60s and the 70s, graphic artists, uh, musicians, photographers, and so on, were severely coastal. And there was a kind of a mm -hmm. um, mutual disdain in both directions. Mm -hmm. going on. That's right. Mm -hmm. And since you saw so many decades of the two coasts of creative people, I wonder what your perspective on that was. Huh. Huh. I'm wondering what you mean. I mean, for 
instance, you, you knew Steve Jerky, mm -hmm. you knew Bob Indiana. Mm -hmm. uh, we were basically East Coast people, although Steve was married to a West Coast right. wife. Uh, and took his sustenance from that mm -hmm. source. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's interesting. Uh, the, the travel from east to west and the, all the way from the 40s through the times that you're talking about um, had tremendous influence on the creative nature of the American experience. Mm -hmm. When we came to San Francisco, uh, San Francisco accepted us in a quite unexpected fashion, <laughs> you know, because uh, the people who came from the East Coast were live wires in a, in a way, or really ambitious, and very often the people in San Francisco were fairly laid back and not, not necessarily. And also, they were there were there was a lot more money out here than there was in New York. Maybe not altogether, you know, if you counted the money, but the money flowed more easily mm. in, uh, in San Francisco and at the Bay Area than it did in the New York, mm. and certainly into the creative world. And receptive, the receptivity of the West was amazing. Mm. And I'm talking about Northern California because yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, although I was somewhat familiar with, with the Hollywood world, it was a completely different story, <laughs> you know, uh, all the way. Um, you know, artists who had nothing to brag about in New York were accepted here and, yeah. and, and, and became very f good friends with the artists out here. Uh, you know, people like Wayne Thibault mm -hmm. and, uh, out of Sacramento, uh, the people at the San Francisco Art Institute, uh, it, was, it was welcome. <laughs> and it was surprising. It, it, was, it, it amazed me at the time that my poetry meant a lot more out here than it did back there. Uh, and uh, in terms of you know, yeah, I, I knew who the people were in charge of at MoMA in New York, but George Culler, who was the director of the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, was available and gave me a show, you know, mm -hmm. for no good reason that I <laughs> could really figure out, but because he, he was welcoming and receptive and and he had some money. He you know, he sent for the work from New York. Yeah. And 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 even Durkey's work, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and it was like uh, <laughs> and it, 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 it was unbelievable. And uh, I had two or three shows in galleries here in, but, and even in the South, uh, which never would have happened in New York. <laughs> but uh, but it, came, it came about because of the first show in New York, which was because of Steve. I mean, Steve introduced me to Alan Stone. Uh, <laughs> and I knew, I knew Stuart because he knew Steve originally, mm -hmm. right? Right. Yeah. What was it like for the women in your circle where you were welcoming to the women artists as you were the young man? Well, there were less women artists putting themselves on the line in those days. 
There were a number of them. For instance, Lenore Twaney in New York, uh, Agnes Martin. Uh, I mean, two incredible Jesus. women artists. Uh, not to talk about yeah. New Mexico uh, with uh, Georgia. With, with yeah. Yeah. Teeth, you know. Uh, so yeah, it was happening, and the San Francisco Art Institute welcomed students who were women in painting and sculpture, and uh, I, I showed there, and I knew, uh, knew them, and I knew a lot of the professors. But uh, and you know, the, the woman who became the director at one time, although there was a kind of a horrible scandal about her. Uh, you know, it was a com completely different time. Uh, I, I, I was involved with women who were in the arts, uh, mostly poetry rather than painting. Uh, but uh, it's a very good question, and you're right, it, it, it took until 20 or 30 years beyond that for women to become as prevalent as they now seem to be and are. Uh, and, you know, that's not even to talk about other minorities. Right. Uh, I mean, I, I was a good friend of my Angelou's, I was a good friend of Huey P. Newton's, uh, the black world mm. is something that I was looking for. Well, a friend of ours, he, uh, Mayo, was a daughter of Heine D'Angulo, and uh, yes. she was a, a painter and a, and a poet. I wonder if you knew her. Mm. Did, did I know? Did you talk about Heine? Did you know her? Did you know her? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're talking about Jaime's daughter. Yeah. I knew her very well. Yeah. <laughs> but Jaime was the, the, the first Californian person that I met. Hmm. Uh, I was taken <laughs> off the airport in a Model A Ford <laughs> up Partington Ridge yeah. where Jaime was living yeah. uh, in a house with a hole in the roof uh, uh, for smoke, and he said hello to me, and uh, I said hello, and he said, uh, your native language is German, uh, isn't it? Uh, he said, and you grew up in New York? I said, how did you figure that out? Here's this guy wearing cut off shorts and nothing else, and bearded and hairy, and I don't know who the hell I, This is called the ranch. The refugee kid uh, thinks the ranch has Indians, you know. There are horses, but there are no Indians. Uh, this is Jaime, but he looks like an Indian. Uh, and of course, the story of Nancy, his wife, I know Nancy very well. Not to talk about the daughter, I, who I assume is still alive. Yes, yes. But I haven't seen her for decades or heard about her. Um, there was a, a problem because I was the one who got Indian Tales by Jaime published by A.A. A. Wynn. Well done. And, wow. and his, his daughter thought it was Robert Duncan who did it. Mm. But it's not true. Uh, I mean, I love <coughs> Robert Duncan. Robert Duncan was a wonderful poet and, and, and more than a poet. And the relationship that he had with the artist uh, who he lived with for quite a long time of his life was a wonderful relationship. And I treasured knowing him. Uh, well, 
I know Guy would really appreciate something from you, so I might ask you to write a little something to her, or maybe I can video you some, something I take or show her. She'd really like that. You mean you, 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 you not only know her, you see her? Yeah. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Done. All right. I have one short question. Was the Vallejo docked or anchored next to the barge? Were they uh, off Sausalito or where? Oh, oh, the, okay. The movement of the barge when it was floating, okay. it was floating right next to the Vallejo. Okay. Which side? Uh, uh, well, here was the Vallejo and here was the barge, so it's to the Our left side. side. Okay. Not that, yeah. However, later on, we had more problems with the barge, and we had to move the barge further north, right. uh, closer to Marin City, right. which mm -hmm. is when Stuart was I living like on it. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so that it was no longer next to the Vallejo. Okay. But it had been floating next to the Vallejo for some years. Okay. Um, and uh, I've been back to the Vallejo since, I mean, recently. Uh, it's, of course, very different now yeah. than it was. They tried to do an uh, artist residence there, but that didn't work very well. <laughs> I'm very glad to hear you. Uh, you are a, a name I heard in my childhood. I'm the daughter of Lawrence and Ethelwyn Stees. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Uh, no kidding. Uh, oh my God. <laughs> they were the, uh, the barge right next to me. It, 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 when it was, uh, yeah, it was in, interesting because I. When, uh, after it was moved up to the coast. Yeah, we ended up moving. Um, Stuart, I think you're still down there. My recollection was in between gate five and gate six. Sure. Um, you know, there was Arc E leg, there were a different, and I think Gary, did you sell it to Jane Buck? Does that ring a bell? Jane was my first wife. I was Adam's age. What? I was Adam's age. So I knew Adam. You were Adam's age? And I knew Adam and Oh, my, my first son Paul, was right? who died of muscular really? yes. dystrophy. Um, so uh, I was a. a I remember Steve's very oh. well. Thank yeah. you. I'm glad, I'm glad to. Um, I'm glad you're alive. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> what happened, if I recall, so there was that barge. It ended up being an ark, because that's what some of the. Uh, barges were lucky enough if they had they could choose they could not be floating anymore so there was less maintenance uh, so there was yours I, it ended up being Gary uh, Appleton it's the one closest to gate 6 now that um, it, yeah it, I believe so I believe so if I'm not wrong because I remember visiting Adam um, there and playing with Paul and Rada um, and then was that old man's place, and it was right next to Gate 6, and then was our barge, and they came to us to Walter Point Harbor. We used to row out to the uh -huh. uh, Charles Van Dam, because right. there wasn't water wow. there, wow. and we would play on it, um, etc. Wow. But then There was they came another to barge right next to ours, <laughs> next to yours. Her name was Marv something, Marv? I can't remember her name, but I remember that an old man ended up with it, and it was just demolished, I think, in the last two years. We were on the other side of that, and they came to us, and they said, if you want a parking lot around you, then stay here, and if you want, if you don't, so T.J. Nelson, who's still there towing mochi and driving piles, wow. he, we towed it to... Um, uh, I can't remember if we went to Gate 5 main dock or Gate 3 because we ended up in a couple of places. Well, Gate and 5 was also where the building that Harry Parch studio was in. I think that's Gate 3. No, Gate 5. I know. Because we're ending up being a sound studio. Bill Lethborough, remember that what? name? Remember Bill Lethborough? No. So, I know. But Bill lived on the bars with me with his wife. 
And with bug wings. <laughs> with bug wings. Remember that weird sound he used to make when he walked by? Sure. Anyway, so I'd like to know you. <laughs> David Weed. And I couldn't um, remember it because you kept saying it was floating. In my recollection, it was along that art form. So thank you, and I send you. And also, I've been in touch a little bit with Alice Ewing. So um, it's a small, small world. And yes, I really? Do <laughs> so, you remember the. the the guy with the very Hebrew last name, very tall, uh, Caro? Caro Caro. Absolutely. He was on the Richmond Santa Fe. The very right. Richmond Santa Fe. Really? I named my son. <coughs> my son's middle name is Caro. Caro and Evelyn. Caro, yeah. And, Perot. and yeah. Um, wow. my dad started in Lone Pine. And they came up very Hero close to yeah. near Bishop. From Portugal. Sorry, I think I've been given this yes. signal to you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> one, more, one, more one more question, guys. Hey, who else? Yeah, Alan Watts ended up spending a lot of his time up at Druid Heights. Right. Up to him, and sure. I wondered if you had any time there or could relate some story, or if not well, that, about the yeah, well, general communist. Well, Michael from Druid Knights is here yeah, yeah, yeah. in front, and uh, I, I was fortunate to be a very close friend of Roger Summers, and Roger and I worked on houses together. I, I was I, I was not the carpenter that he was, but I I was worked as a carpenter, and Roger offered his shop for me to. Build the seven foot contact is the only love which we built in this shop in Druid Heights, which I never knew it was called Druid Heights. It was just Roger's place, right? <laughs> it was Roger's home, and I, I took my first acid trip in that house uh, with, with quite a few people. You sure did. I dosed you. <laughs> <laughs> Etc. Etc. Et <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I have a picture in this bag of myself and Roger's wife Barbara sitting in his house at that time, and uh, she's still alive. She lives in New York now. And I, I haven't seen her yet, but I'm going to very soon. But uh, that was a very different time, and Roger was an incredible designer and an incredible craftsperson and he was not your ordinary uh, either, either of those. His designs were extraordinary and, and not conventional and his way of working with wood and other materials was also innovative uh, and he uh, um, yes? Excuse me for this question, Gerd, but I can't resist. What are your memories of Che Guevara? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> um, che. You remember everybody, so no. you must remember Che Guevara, Gerd. <laughs> I don't. No. Okay. I, I don't have any okay. real All right. memories. All right. uh, the... The, the, the memories I have of Cuba have to do with helping Huey P. Newton uh, escape there um, with Bert Schneider from Hollywood. Oh, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and, uh, and knowing Huey thereafter, and realizing that while, while he was in Cuba, he had known people that I wound up knowing in Jamaica later, uh, rather intimately. And uh, so uh, that's about it. And I, I was actually on the way to Cuba, to Cuba and Haiti when I was in my early teens with, I was supposed to 
help Maya Deren, who was going to make a film there, and she needed somebody to carry her cameras, and she uh, wanted me to do it, but somehow she chose somebody who was different when she actually did it, so I didn't get to go. <coughs> One question. Does anyone here know if Marta's daughter, Vagadu, is still in the area? Yeah, she is. I think. She, I, think I thought so. she passed away. Oh, that's right. Yeah, in, in the book that's in the store here about yeah. Barda, a really yeah. I highly recommended book. Yeah, um, it's good. it's dedicated to her, and she passed in 13 or, 13 or 14. She passed away. Yeah. Was it that one? Okay. That's what I remember seeing. I just want to thank you both for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Did you? Thank you. Anybody, you want to, anybody wants a book, I will be fine. Yeah, I've gone down to London. It's great. It's